police brutality means destruction for our people in the struggle, our people trying to make it out and around this system of oppression. Police brutality is only part of the oppression we face, but we must organize against any and all injustices we face. Right now, police brutality is coming at us hard. They don't want us to get far. So let me point out how brutal this system is. Throughout history, there have been many civil rights violations from the days Martin Luther King Jr. and the orchestrated peaceful sit-ins to today's with stop and frisk. This didn't stop since then and even though the violation continued on people of color. Nowadays, the news of these violations travel faster because everything has been caught on cameras, but yet no justice has been made. We live in a time where a little boy is being shot in a park for playing with a toy gun, a teenager is being killed for a bottle of juice and candy, or an illegal entrance of the police to a house and killing a person of color in front of his grandmother. Martin Luther King asks his followers to keep their marches non-violent this example is still being followed in today's protest to demand the same civil rights Martin Luther King Jr. rallied for in 1955. Still, in 2016, we continue to protest and speak to legislatives for these same rights. People are still asking for these same rights after being excluded from any human rights or dignity. Today's protesters are fighting against poverty, being arrested without a reason, suffering from disabilities without getting any assistance, and a lot of inhuman behavior towards them. A civil right has, is interesting because it involves uh, the law, but it also involves human behavior. Uh, and a civil right is something that every individual has to define for him or herself. You and I may, may agree that we have certain civil rights or disagree about our rights. And when the law comes into play, the law has to say, no, this is your specific right as uh, defined under law through the Constitution and essentially adjudicated through the system. Well, for me, a civil right is, for me, is my rights as a, a man of color that I felt like was fought for me from a, way, a while back and that I think that is needed in this country to remind people of things that we need to move forward. Um, for instance, voting. Um, people died, shed blood, lost their lives for that civil right to go out and go vote. And I think that once we understand that these were rights that weren't initially given to us, that we had to fight for, protest for, picket for, these were things that were fought for for us to have, for us to be a better people. To what extent does the Bill of Rights actually benefit the citizen? The Bill of Rights is something that you have to be educated in it to truly understand it. And it goes back to the answer and the other question that I have with you. If you don't know about the Bill of Rights, you don't know how it affects you. Um, but the reality of it is, is that a lot of people don't care about the Bill of Rights. A lot of people don't care about their rights as citizens. A lot of people don't care about the Voting Act and things of that nature because when you're trying to take care of your family, you're trying to find work, you're trying to become a citizen of this country, you're trying to get medical benefits, you're trying to keep your kids in school and keep them fed. A lot of the things that are our natural rights, we tend to ignore. My thoughts on people knowing and understanding their rights. Um, I think it is important that people know their rights, but understanding that the police operate in a way that violates our rights and they know and understand that. I think that people should know all of their rights. I think that people should I think learning your civil rights is just as important as you learning how to tie your shoes, learning how to read, learning how to write. Because in the world that we live in right now, the worst that can happen to you is the least that you know. So the more informed you are, the less likely that things or situations can happen to you. More importantly than that, the more informed you are, the better decisions that you'll make in your life. People are going to workshops, they are going to classes that are teaching about knowing our rights, but our rights are still being violated anyways. We have to question who are our rights originated to. Unfortunately, we've seen so many instances where people have known their rights or where people are not doing anything and the cops still assault them, harass them, and sometimes even kill them. So um, I think that we're going to have to look for further measures than knowing our rights in order to solve the issue. 
if I knew my um, my rights on on stop and frisk, I also know the situations that'll put me in those circumstances. Even though there's times that we can't avoid those situations, but plenty of times of me being a man of color, I was able to talk myself out of a high risk situation or de-escalate it just because I was informed about my rights. But at the same time, I was humble about it and I wasn't arrogant about it. And we have to understand that, unfortunately, us being people of color, we have to go by a different playbook than other people. See, I think it's important for people to know their rights, but it's more important, you know, once you get to that point to understand that there is no reforming this system, right? You gotta get rid of this system. And if you look at history, Every system is replaced by a new system, right? But it doesn't happen by magic. People have to get involved. People have to learn. They have to do their political education. People have to do day-to-day -day organizing so they can understand what's happening so that we can affect. It's going to change, but we have to make sure that that change is affected in a way that benefits us. In the 1980s, school violence surged, as did school shootings. As a result, police presence had increased and some schools nationwide are now protected by school security guards and metal detectors to avoid any future incidents. The presence of school security would seem to have been an ideal solution by itself. But soon after, in the 1990s, schools made predetermined laws that usually resulted in harsh aftermath for the student. This is known as a zero tolerance policy. Regardless of the circumstances, the punishment imposed on the student was severe. These policies were meant to counter violence, drug use, and bringing in weapons into schools. However, these policies are often being used against students that have been arrested, suspended, or even expelled for simply talking back or carrying suspicious weapons such as nail clippers. Suspended and expelled children are often left unsupervised and without constructive activities. There's a lack of resources in many schools, such as insufficient funding, special education services, counselors, textbooks, and not enough space in classrooms. This causes students to be pushed down the pipeline and into the juvenile justice system. How is the school security in this school? My understanding of school security here is that the principals work very closely with uh, the school safety officers. That tends to, to be enough to run our building smoothly on a daily basis. Uh, we also have a relationship with certain of, of the police officers at our precinct who are designated to be the point people for our school. And my understanding is that that has generally been positive. Uh, the police presence on our school campus, in, in our building, um, it can be regular, but has never felt to me traumatic, has never felt as though it's a, an invasion by warriors to, uh, to lock down our, uh, our campus, to keep law and order. For me, the school to prison pipeline is that when you're in school, public school, you don't receive the resources that you need for you to be successful, to move on to post-secondary school, to move on to college. And what that ends up doing is, is that you start neglecting education and then you start turning more towards the streets. You drop out of school or what I've been told was that prisons are dictated based off of a third grade reading and math level. Like based off people's scores in third grade, they decide what type of pr how many prisons they need to build when they get older. Um, which I think is a horrible circumstance because what they're doing is they're gauging the education of young people and kind of projecting whether or not they're going to be successful when they move on. When in reality, if you don't have the resources that you need at a young person age in third or fourth grade, how are you even going to be successful when you move forward? Um, so a part of me do feel like that based off where we live at, it's kind of set up for us to fail. Um, like schools in East Harlem or schools in the Bronx that don't have the resources, don't have the up-to-date technology, don't have the computers or the smart boards in the classrooms. We're being taught prehistorically by chalkboards and chalk where if you go to schools downtown or Lower East Side, they have the technology, they have the equipment for them to be better off. And I think that that's the way that how they keep us trapped into a system. Um, 
Another problem that we have is it's very hard for parents to move their kids to schools out of the district. Like we're locked into the district of the schools that we have and the resources are very small and in between and it's almost impossible for you to transfer your child from to a better school because of where you live. How are students affected by the school's disciplinary system? Oh, students are absolutely affected by the disciplinary system. Well, what's happening is that, you know, that thing called school to prison pipeline, right? And so if you go into school, they have this bell system, just like the prison system. A lot of our schools even look like prisons. And, you know, I'm a teacher. I've been teaching 13 years. And a lot of times teachers act like COs, like correction officers. I mean, if you think about it, if your school has metal detectors, or if you have security, or if there's an actual um, police department at your school, do you feel safe going to school? Do you feel like this is an environment that encourages your learning and that you want to be at? Do you feel like you can freely be yourself despite your identity, um, the clubs and extracurricular activities that you want to go to? I mean, police, security, all of these things in a school don't make students feel like this is a space where they can be themselves, where they can be free, where they can express their voices. Stand up, sit down, you know, you can't go to the bathroom, be quiet, you know, and uh, right now I'm reading this book by uh, Christopher Emden. It's about reality pedagogy, and it's called um, For White Folks Who Teach in the Hood, and the rest of y'all too. Krista Emden then calls it symbolic violence, where when you tell a kid that, oh, pull up your pants, or when you tell a kid that um, the way they look, the way they sound is not proper, right? You, you're perpetuating violence on that young person. There's more harm when you have this harsh security in the schools, and not only that, teachers reinforce disciplinary consequences that are then followed up by the security and the police at the school. So there are, there's no strong relationships that support student voices. So I would say that students are directly impacted by the disciplinary actions at school. What are some of the things that make students feel like they're already in prison? Well, for instance, for me, it, it was more about my experience when I was in high school. When I was in high school, it made me feel like I was in prison. For one, I had to stand in a long line to go through a metal detector. The second thing was that it was police officers walking through my hallways. Um, the third thing was that I wasn't allowed to go outside for lunch, so I wasn't allowed to go outside and just be free and figure out, discover myself in the city. Um, I went to school downtown in midtown Manhattan, and I would have loved to went outside and seen the culture, seen the churches, seen the museums. But when I was in school, they didn't even trust us to leave the building. And um, that was kind of like when my mom was in prison. She was locked into a space. She had to ask permission to go to the bathroom. She had to ask permission that could she leave. Um, they locked the doors on you. They locked the gates on you while you're inside school. You didn't allow us any type of creative trust for us to go outside and be students. Where you go downtown or you go to upstate New York or you go outside of New York State, um, students are allowed to intern in different organizations, work at different companies, able to kind of sort their oats and, and figure out ways educationally or intellectually and where they want to be in a career. Where with us, they don't trust us to do any of those things. The only time we're allowed to leave the building is when we're coming to school, excuse me, or when we're leaving school. How could school districts prevent from students from being adjusted to this lifestyle? By bringing in stakeholders from the community that are invested in the community. I think that when you're looking at your community district, when you're looking at your parent board, when you're looking at your school board, you need to bring the successful people that came from out of that system and invest them back in. Or more importantly, look at the colleges that are in your area and invest them back into the schools or work with civic engagement organizations like AmeriCorps and City Year and bring them back into the public schools because I think that we don't have the answer. We thought that we did, but this generation is so dynamic and so different that now we have to meet them and adjust our game plan to the young people right now. Um, we're not discussing the post-traumatic stresses that young people are going through when they're witnessing that their friends are dying by gun violence. The only thing that we really think about is the military when there's literally a war going on in these streets every day. Um, we have to get accustomed to knowing that fifth graders and fourth graders are losing their friends also, losing their brothers and losing their sisters. And I think that if we reallocate our resources and really 
focus on more real life situations that we'll be able to accommodate those real life students. Most think that it just started happening, but it has been around for more than a lifetime. In fact, police brutality got its identity in the early 1870s when a Chicago Tribune reported a beating of a man under arrest in the Harrison Street police station. It's just now being noticed more often because of social media and the people coming forward. 147 years later, 920 people have been reported to being killed by police due to police brutality in 2015 alone. 32% of black people killed by police were unarmed. How do you feel about the recent string of events that has happened throughout America regarding police brutality? I think that this was something that was destined to happen due to the fact of lack of communication and understanding on both sides. Um, I've had relationships with NYPD officers because I've created initiatives in my community. But the relationships that I have with the police officers does not take away what I teach my children. I have three young boys and I'm afraid of the world that they're gonna move into. And I think that with the police interaction, this was something that people are tired. People are tired of hearing the news, how the news portray us. People are tired of watching another man of color die, another man, another woman of color die. And sooner or later, people were going to stand up. I think that's something that's very interesting that's been going on is that the two extreme instances that happened, the one that happened in New Orleans and the one that happened in Dallas, two of those young men served in the military. So we also have to have a conversation about the mental health issues that are going on right now too, because they fought in wars. Um, they've seen their friends get blown up. They've seen lives being taken. And right now, we're watching this on the news every day. Um, obviously, I'm angry. I'm sad and I'm hurt. Um, but again, this we are in a system that reinforces violence, that oppresses our people. Um, and it is all intentional. And we have to wake up and recognize that and know that this is a part of not only the police state, because that's one apparatus behind it, but it is a part of capitalism. It is a part of this bigger system that we've been living in that's been keeping us down in our employment, that's been keeping us down in our housing. We have to recognize all these signs. So for me, it's about connecting the dots and seeing that there are bigger issues going on. And we have to address it all as one. What is racial? profiling. So racial profiling is basically where law enforcement uses discriminatory practices to either stop, question, and frisk, and even, even arrest people based upon their race or ethnicity, national origin. How is it affecting us? It's affecting us because we're losing our lives. Um, it's the world is becoming a much more tense place. Um, we have to make decisions whether or not is it safe for us to raise our children here. You have people who live in New York City, uh, young men of color in particular, who are stopped more frequently by police officers. And I mean, what we heard from the clients that we serve and what we know from some of the, the research around uh, racial profiling is that people feel kind of frustrated and they feel targeted by law enforcement, many of them for not having been involved in crime at all. Before it used to just be, you know, go to school, eat your vegetables, have manners and you'll be successful. Now while us raising young people, we have to have the conversation with them about what happens if you get stopped by police. What, what's the rights that you need to say? I never thought in a million years that I thought I, I needed to tell my 12 year old kid what does he need to say if he was stopped by police. The research that was done found that the vast majority of people who were stopped had not been involved in any crime, were not carrying guns. And so, you know, it can be challenging for these people and it can, you know, there could be alienation in that particular community, young people feeling like, you know, the police officers don't respect me and, you know, even like their parents and so forth feeling like, you know, every time I turn around my child is stopped. You know, the question is, you know, is it right for them to to again pull people over and stop them when they haven't determined that it, these individuals have been involved in any crime. How can knowing your rights de-escalate police harassment? Knowing your rights to de-escalate police harassment is understanding that there's a yin to a yang. Um, 
there's a black to a white, red to a blue. Um, there's a way that you can inform somebody that has the authority over you to say that you understand your rights and what you have leverage to, what you have access to, what you have knowledge to, what you have that you know what they know, which is in turn you know what they cannot and can do to violate you. Um, and for me, one of the instances that happened to me was that I was pulled over with my sons. And um, this police officer asked, can he go in my glove compartment in my car? And I told him that he had to have a warrant for that because my glove compartment was locked. But I did speak to him in a respectful way. I said, officer, I'm not trying to be a troublemaker. My glove compartment is locked. And I wanted to know that do you have any reasonable cause for you to go into my glove compartment? And he just said he wanted to make sure I didn't have any guns on me. And I informed the officer, I didn't give any, you pulled me over for a, tra a tra traffic stop. You didn't pull me over for suspicion of guns. Did I fit the description of anything and things of that nature? And what he eventually said to me was that he was just having a bad day and that he just told me to go on and enjoy my day. But I think what ended up happening was I knew my rights, but I wasn't arrogant about it. And I just informed him, like, officer, I know my rights. I'm not trying to start a problem. This is where I'm going. I'm in the car with my son. But I also understood that as a man of color, I couldn't be arrogant. And I had to know that I had to play on their playing ground. And by me knowing my rights, I think de-escalated the situation. And maybe if that officer was having a bad day, he knew that I was the wrong person to pick on. About the Sandra Bland case. Right. She, she also knew her rights, too. But it went to Sorry. like a whole nother level. Mm -hmm. What's your thoughts on that? These are the examples of people abusing their power. And she didn't, she didn't deserve to lose her life. And even though she knew her rights, people still didn't care. And I think the fact that people didn't care and she lost her life and nobody really knows the answer. I mean, we as educated people have a pretty good idea of what happened to her, but I think that it was unfortunate. I think that we need to be mindful and continue to fight for our rights moving forward. And we also need to know that this fight is not done yet because we're still losing our lives. Innocent people are still losing their lives, even though they know all the right things to say, when to say it, educated and things of that nature, the outcome still remains the same. So we have to stay vigilant and fighting, and we have to continue to hold people accountable. What are some ways you think we can stop police violence? Communication. I think that we need to come together and understand that police have a presence in this world, they need to keep us safe. There need to be checks and balances. But there are things that we do that kind of, we could stop that bleeding, for lack of a better word. Um, if we work together as a community, stop ignoring that young person that you walking by that you know need an opportunity. Us as a culture, we spend too much time keeping things to ourselves. Oh, this is great. I'm going to keep this for myself. I'm not going to tell anybody. The more we share opportunities, the better off our world will be. When people understand that if if you can save three people, if every one person can, not even save, if every one person can give a resource to three other younger people that they know needs it, this world would be a better place. When I do recruitment for my, for my program, I post on Facebook and I tell people, hit the share button on Facebook. That's all it really takes. If you hit that share button on your Facebook one time, somebody on your social media network is going to see an opportunity and say, you know what, I want that. And what people fail to realize is that every young adult has another young person watching them, mimicking them, and wanting to be like them. But you'll never know it. So how you carry yourself, how you believe in yourself, how you help another person, another younger person is looking at that and saying, this must be, this is cool. I want to be like him or her. So if we try to set up higher standards for ourselves, we'll set up higher standards for our community and for our children. So police harassment is being recognized nowadays far more often than it was previously because of social media. I mean, people walk around with their cameras, they're more inclined to tape interactions with police officers, and that's not something that was available to people 10, 20, 30 years ago. So you have young people that are far more sophisticated than anyone else with their, with their gadgets. You know, they have, you know, nice phones, they know how to use them, and so they are documenting encounters in a way that has not been documented in the past, and this is something that is kind of like a trend now where you see 
people are actively going out now and trying to determine, you know, when police have interaction with the public, they're pulling out their cameras almost like immediately to, to see if the interaction is, you know, what we identify as appropriate. And from some of these videos, we see that a lot of times it's not appropriate. You know, we want to give credit, obviously, to police officers who are doing the right thing. They're protecting our communities, and they are, you know, working really hard to, to try to do that. But then there are, you know, some officers who really, who are really making it look bad for the officers who work hard every day to, to increase public safety. Is there any message that you would like to send to any of the viewers? The message I'd like to send is that I think everyone who, everyone who uh, cares about students and children and school communities and the success of those individual students and the ultimate betterment and success of the country should ask themselves, well, what can I do? Because many people are sitting on, are sitting on a resource, which is themselves. Can I do anything? And there's nothing too small that the individual can do. And as I say, I think no one of goodwill would be denied a place at the table if they want to bring something to help school communities. As we see these growing crises in the world, uh, it becomes increasingly important for us to come together as a community like we're doing today, um, but to continue doing it both uh, both as a healing process for us and then also as uh, in terms of organizing in our communities and organizing with um, other people who are facing uh, exploitation and oppression um, in order to fundamentally change the system we live in. We can't be demoralized in where we're at. Police killings are hurtful. Um, they impact us deeply. Um, we look to our left and our right, and that could be our fathers, that could be our brothers, that could be our sisters. Um, but we need to understand that this is this has been happening for 500 years and more, and we have to understand that um, the issue of police violence is not about race relations. Um, it is not about good cop, bad cop. It's really about us mobilizing and protecting our communities and standing up for our communities, and we need to figure out how. We need to figure out how to have popular control over our communities and our police departments so that we can fight and that we can stand up for what's right. Unfortunately, the way the world is right now, um, it's sad to go on social media. It's sad to watch the news because all you're hearing is about is negative things that are happening in the world. But just like in the early ages when we started working on our civil rights, a lot of bad had to happen before great good had to happen. And I think that if we continue to push this good fight, that all the lives that are being lost are not in vain, whether they're African Americans or police officers, and eventually we're gonna come to the greater good for our people, our community, and our society. We just gotta continue to keep pushing and keep fighting.